Welcome ladies and gentlemen of the old world. I hope you're all doing well and welcome to the first of many guides here on the channel for Total War Warhammer 3. So today's video is going to be the first guide in the series and it is going to be the Corn Army Guide. So we're going to be looking at the entire roster, looking at every single unit, Lord, uh, Hero, all that good stuff, evaluating their strengths and weaknesses. We'll be looking at the unique army abilities that they have and also evaluating these units for both campaign as well as multiplayer. So very excited for this. And there will also be a part two of the guide coming out in the next couple weeks, which is going to be focusing on multiplayer specific builds. So today we'll indeed be looking at the roster overall, and we will be talking about the efficacy of units in multiplayer, but we're not going to be giving specific builds for every single matchup. When we are able to post multiplayer content, I will be putting out multiplayer guides. So you'll have a build if you're playing corn for every single matchup. So without further ado, skulls for the skull throne, blood for the blood god, all that good stuff. Saying it backwards for style points, and let's get this party started and take a look at the roster. So here we have Scarbrand the Exiled. He is the legendary lord here for Corn. He is incredibly strong. So let's go ahead and break down his abilities and his stats and all that neat stuff. So pretty heavily armored, good leadership, of course, by demonic standards, because demon units, much like the undead, do crumble in a similar fashion. He's uh, got incredible melee attack with magic damage, which is very pertinent, as well as fire damage. Now, flaming attacks in Total War Warhammer 3 are very, very valuable because healing is probably one of the strongest mechanics in all of Total War Warhammer, right? So units that are hit by flaming attacks heal at half the usual rate whilst on fire. So it's going to really be mitigating the effectiveness of healing, which is so good. Imagine having him like beating down a vampire caster who's just being super obnoxious with invocation of the heck. I'm really happy that there's another mechanic in the game that counters healing because healing can be really oppressive and ultimately at times quite unfun. So we got Scarbrand the Exiled. He has uh, got okay melee defense, and that's kind of the thing about Corn. Corn is not squishy. Most of their roster is super heavily armored and honestly very, very durable. His weapon strength might seem low at 465. You're like, what? This this greater demon of Corn should have at least as much as like Grimgore Ironhide. Well, he actually has much more. If you scroll uh, scroll down his passive abilities here, he does have uh, the uh, where is it? The frenzy. Yes. Yeah. So the frenzy is going to be giving him a base extra 10% on top of that. So his weapon strength when he starts is actually actually quite a bit higher. It's just over 500 and that is only scratching the tip of the iceberg. So he does have Fueled by Rage. This gives him a base weapon damage of 25% and armor piercing as well. And that's what's really crazy about Scarbrand. He has a couple abilities which are percentage-based you know, buffs, right? So 25% here. He has the Wrathful Reaper as well, which gives him 50 and 50, uh, but this one also rampages him. So you have to be very careful. Wrathful Reaper is very good if you can find an enemy SEM out on its own or a high value target and then pop it. Oftentimes, if you pop it in the middle of a blob, he's just going to start beating on random things and it might not necessarily go where you want him to. So use it very wisely. But when this becomes crazy is because of his item, which I think is one of the cooler mechanics. I really like this. Uh, as he gets more and more kills, more skulls for the skull throne, uh, he's going to be getting more base weapon damage up to 100%. So you can increase his base weapon damage by 100% at which point he's going to be sitting like around a thousand. Then you can use the Wrathful Reaper and Fueled by Rage. Well, Fueled by Rage is conditional on him being below 50% HP, but if that is active, 50% plus the 25 here, Scarbrand can be the destroyer of worlds, which is super cool. I really love the Berserker mechanic. He starts off kind of unassuming, but as he gets more like bloodthirsty, it's just, well, I, I would hesitate to call this profile unassuming, but you guys essentially get the picture. But he does have physical resist as well as spell resistance, a pretty common trope across the corn roster, so we won't be touching upon that too much you can kind of assume that most units do have it uh, but spell resist basically is a little bit different than magic resist they, they've reworked it a little bit it makes them of course durable against magical abilities and uh, yeah damage of spells magical abilities is reduced not by magic attack so slightly different which is quite neat. So obviously we're going to be seeing that applied to the dwarves, but that's how corn you know, deals with magic since they don't really have magic. But army abilities really you know, help with that. And we'll be seeing that later in the video. So Scarband, I think is going to be very good. He does also have rage embodied. This one is a small AOE and rage. So the radius is really small. It's 35 meters, but when he pops it, it rampages all nearby targets. So what you want to do with Scarbrand is run him up on enemy casters, enemy squishy SEMs. If you can catch something in the back line that's of high value, let's say some missile units, uh, you pop it on them so they can't run away. And then you just go to town on those targets. And this is going to be great in campaign, but also super good in multiplayer. If you're able to catch somebody's like, let's say a life wizard, that thing is going to get taken to pound town so badly by Scarbrand. But sadly, he can't fly. That's really his only downside. And he does also have a breath attack via the Bellow of Endless Fury, which is very similar to breath attacks in Total War Warhammer 2. 
uh, but a little bit better. I think breath attacks have been reworked in uh, Warhammer 3, but again, we'll see once we eventually get the Mortal Empire's goodness. Now, the next lore choice for Korn is going to be the Exalted Bloodthirster. So every uh, Chaos faction does have access to uh, basically an Exalted variant of the Great Demon and the Named variant. But this guy's pretty good, and he's very different and unique. So he brings other goodness to the table. Uh, he flies, number one, so he's much more mobile than Scarbrand. If you're playing in campaign uh, city battles, he can fly up on the Palisades. He can get back into the back of the city, uh, really you know, punish things and go after towers and uh, settlements. So that's really nice. Scarbrand can't do that. He does also have the Wrath of Corn, and this ability is awesome. So, and it's very thematic for Corn too. Basically, when an enemy caster within 60 meters casts a spell, uh, they take base damage of 256, uh, and they also get lit on fire. Now, think about how good this is in multiplayer against like vampire counts or factions that have healing spells. Their caster is going to cast a heal. They'll not only take damage, but they're also going to be lit on fire. Uh, so if they're trying to heal themselves, for example, like a vampire count lord, well, they're going to be healing at half the rate because they're on fire, which I think is awesome. So we got Bloodthirst for speed, charge bonus, you know, all that sort of good stuff. Deathbringer is an activatable buff, very similar to Scarbrand's goodness, but it doesn't rampage him. So a little bit more controlled. He also has the same breath attack and Burning Rage, which is an AoE explosion, very similar to Verminous Valor, which is decent. Uh, I've honestly had pretty good success with this guy. I think he's uh, very, very strong and uh, certainly in many situations might be better than Scarbrand, depending on the terrain of the battlefield or also uh, just the style of your army. If you're looking for a more mobile force, he certainly is... A little bit more well suited for that. So he can obviously fly. He has wounds, demonic instability, wrath of corn. We talked about physical and spell resistance. Now the next lord we shall look at is the herald of corn. He is uh, he's okay, honestly. I feel like the greater demons in corn are really damn good. He has the juggernaut mount, which of course is the basic kind of uh, you know bear mount, uh, horse mount. It's like an empire character who rides like a barded warhorse, except it has you know better armor piercing values. And he has the Blood Throne. The Blood Throne is a, is a motorcycle. Basically, it's an SEM chariot. You can see them down here if you look at the stats. Uh, it does bring some cool stuff to the table because it does give your Lord healing. So uh, if you look at what it brings, it brings the Totem of Endless Bloodletting, which, well, that actually comes with that character, but it gives him Gore Feast. Gore Feast means that when he's in melee, he's going to be healing 0.1% of his total HP per second. So that does come only with the Blood Shrine of Corn. Now, looking at his base profile, he's got some okay abilities. Revel and Slaughter gives an AoE constant buff of leadership and melee attack, which helps the lower leadership demons fight longer. And he's got Locus of Wrath, which is an activatable ability that gives a 40 melee attack to nearby units. Overall, I think he's much weaker and far less impactful than the greater demons. But again, depending on the army style you're playing, he's cheaper. You can put him on the motorcycle, which gives him constant healing and a really good mobile buffing stick. So really more to be explored with him. But personally, I'm a huge fan of Scarbrand uh, and the Exalted Bloodthirster and just in battle and I think they really just do an excellent job. So heroes, we have two heroes. We have both a mortal hero in the Blood Reaper as well as the Cultist of Corn. So the uh, Blood Reaper here has a juggernaut and motorcycle mount. So you can have like a full wild hogs build with corn and they actually sound like motorcycles, which I think is incredibly awesome. He has Foe Seeker, Deadly Onslaught, and the Locus of Abjuration. Now, this one gives uh, a, an activatable buff, which gives 66% spell resist. So, for example, if you're expecting your opponent to be bringing pendulums against you in a multiplayer battle, you can pop this to get 66% spell resist on top of Corn, who already is rocking mostly 20 to 25%. So you can get up to pretty much be impervious to spell damage. Granted, he can't be everywhere at once, but if there is a high-value target, let's say you bring a very elite unit like... Uh, like a Chaos Warriors with dual weapons or Exalted Bloodletters of Corn, which are very, very good, but also susceptible to spell beatings, you can run him with them and use that ability to prevent the damage. Next up, we have the Cultist of Corn. He is a mortal follower. He's got some okay items, uh, Icon of Endless War and Sword of Antiheroes. Nothing exciting here, really. He has a Chaos Steed mount. And why you bring him is because he has the Gate of Corn. Uh, he can summon a unit of blood letters that do degrade over time, but if there's a valuable point you're trying to capture in like a siege battle or on open battle, you know, it can be nice for shutting down missiles in the backfield and really, really doing a good job. So I'm a huge fan of the Cultists of Corn in campaign. And in PvP, you know, he's going to have some salt for sure. Being able to summon units is never a bad thing, but. Once he summons his one unit, he's kind of just like not that great. He doesn't have a ton of buffs, so really, really take it into consideration. Uh, but it's a cool unit. Certainly gives you some uh, you know magic feels with the Gate of Corn. So now looking at the infantry of Corn, they have five options. So the thing with Corn is they're a very elite army. They don't really have any cheap options. You have the Chaos Warriors of Corn, which are the sword and board, and all these units have frenzy. That's kind of the unique mechanic of Corn. So when you look at their stats, you want to be adding 10% plus extra melee attack and charge bonus. So the stats, you know, just kind of take that as you will. And remember, they do have frenzy, but 
Chaos Warriors of Corn are really good. Uh, they, like I said, are very durable. They have 40 melee defense, uh, 100 armor, and of course do have Frenzy. Great for just holding a point that you're really looking to defend, you know, decent front line piece. If you're facing off against a faction with a ton of missiles, these guys make a decent, uh, you know, a pretty decent choice. But what I really like about Corn is the next unit, the Chaos Warriors of Corn with dual weapons. These guys are freaking awesome. And the reason why is because they're like Norsk and Berserkers, which are an awesome unit, but they also have 100 armor and are mega durable. And that's really kind of the story of Corn. They are basically just Norsk and Berserkers with 100 armor, and that's really strong. Next up, we have Chaos Warriors of Corn with Halberds. So looking at them, they have Charge Defense First Large. Pretty okay stat line, very similar to Chaos Warriors, honestly not that different. But what they also have is Charge Reflection, which is a new mechanic here. So when bracing, this unit deals additional damage when attacking charging enemies. So when you get charged, they get a temporary damage spike when they're fighting back, which I really, really like that mechanic. I think that's nice. And of course, they still have their old school bonus versus large. Now, as far as the corn infantry units, we have blood letters and exalted blood letters of corn. Typically, the paradigm for the infantry with corn is you want to be using the mortals when you're facing lightly armored rosters. So if you're facing somebody, let's say, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, like Norska. Uh, I would highly recommend bringing the Chaos Warriors of Corn because their armor is going to pay huge dividends against Marauders and Berserker type units. And they hit very, very hard, but they just lack armor piercing. So if you're facing against factions that have light armor, uh, let's say, for example, like, you know, Wood Elves or whatever, you're going to want to bring Chaos Warriors of Corn because uh, they're shielded and hit pretty hard against light armor. But if you're playing against armor, like Cathay, for example, is a super, super armored faction. So having the Blood Letters of Corn against Cathay is going to be much more efficient, most likely, than the Chaos Warriors. Yes, they're a little bit squishier, but nonetheless, they are very, very hard hitting, and they also do have a bonus for his infantry. So you have 34 weapon strength with good armor piercing values. You also have physical resist to help compensate. And looking at the Exalted Blood Letters, man, oh man, these guys hit like absolute trucks with 44 weapon strength, massive bonus for his infantry, and huge melee attack. On top of that, they do have the uh, Hellblade ability. So uh, this is a really cool trait that corn uh, demons have. The mortals do not have it, but the demonic units, the elite ones do have it, the Hellblade. So once they get 60 kills, so let's say that these uh, exalted bloodletters of corn get in there and they just massacre a bunch of, you know, Cathay peasants, for example, right? Well, suddenly they're going to be getting base 20% damage. So 20% here is going to be uh, plus in like eight or 10 extra weapon strengths. So that's really, really strong. And they're relatively quick with 38 speed, whereas the mortals are potatoes. So you can sometimes use like a mortal front line, have the demons on the flanks. If you're facing a mixed forces army that has a combination of armor, you can, you know, mix and match and make sure they get those good engagements. So those are the infantry of corn. Overall, they're very, very good, uh, especially the chaos warriors of corn with dual weapons. I found them to be the most effective in uh, battle. They're able to really, really just endure, whereas the demons can get taken out by bow fire really quickly. I find that the chaos warriors of corn with dual weapons are probably my favorite infantry choice. They're AP isn't that bad. So honestly, that in conjunction with their durability, I think makes them like a huge, huge uh, plus for you. So looking at the Chaos uh, Cavalry and Chariots, yes, we have the Gorby's Chariot. Don't really need to talk about that. You guys know it from Warhammer. It's okay. I really think uh, there are better options here for corn, but it's a Gorby's Chariot and it's an expensive armor piercing chariot. I think there's better options. You have the Blood Crushers of corn. These guys are one of the two elite cav choices that corn have. And these guys are pretty straightforward. They have the same, they're basically mounted exalted blood letters. They have Hellblade, so they do more and more damage over time. They have 100 armor, which is really nice. Unlike demons, they're still quite resilient in that regard, but a little bit squishier than the more elite variant, which is the Skull Crushers. But yeah, bonus first infantry. They also do have the physical resist. Bring these guys if you're facing a faction where you don't expect big mounted resistance. If you're facing off against the Empire, who has Demogriff Knights, or against Kislev, who has the Bear Cavalry, these guys are not going to be the choice for you. They're really good against infantry-based factions, but they will not trade super effectively into enemy, like, big heavy cavalry. Granted, they have good AP, so they still can compared to like, you know, units that you might see in other rosters that of course are infantry specific cavalry because they have AP, it makes them a more of a generalist, but typically that's not really their role. They're really good at killing armored infantry. If you're looking at foot squires, great swords, that's what these guys give the business to. Now, the most elite unit that Korn has here in the cavalry slot is the Skull Crusher, and I really like them quite a bit. They don't have the Hellblade, but these guys are middle linebackers. Typically big cavalry are gonna be getting shot by missiles, and they're shielded. They have 30 more armor than the uh, than the uh, blood crushers here. They have better combat stats. They do not have a bonus for infantry. They're more like 
questing knights on steroids. So if you guys like questing knights, just think of them in that role. They're like armored questing knights that are quite a bit stronger across the board and do also have frenzy. So remember their base stat line, it's going to be quite a bit better because the frenzy will be kicking in if their leadership is higher than 50%. So I do like skull crushers, very expensive, but if you do bring them to the battlefield, they can be super dominant, especially in smaller scale battles and really uh, can run over whatever they're really looking at with those stats. And they look super cool too. Now, going down to the Monsters and Beasts, we have Chaos Warhounds of Corn. Nothing terribly exciting. These are just Hound units. You guys know them from Warhammer 1. Cheap, effective option at cutting down enemy missiles and routing off enemy units that are already running. Furies of Corn are amazing. And I think Furies in general in multiplayer are going to be an absolute nightmare. Uh, they have 44 weapon strength and 36 melee attack and 110 speed. If you're looking at something to just quickly kill a unit of handgunners or any unit that is in that similar vein, Chaos Furies of Corn are just legendary. And they're really, really cheap in multiplayer. And in campaign, they're okay for like initial skirmishes and just diving on missile units. But again, I think this is really going to be a huge MVP in multiplayer. Now, the next unit we're going to be talking about is the Flesh Hounds of Corn. These are probably my favorite unit in the entire Corn roster, aside from the dual weapon Chaos Warriors. These guys have 65 weapon strength, pretty damn good combat stats, 95 speed, and a charge bonus of 46. So they're very similar to the Norskin of uh, Frost Wolves. They don't have Frostbite, but overall they hit much harder. Uh, they do have physical resist and spell resist of 50%, so very, very tough to get rid of them, rid of them with things like Spirit Leech. But Flesh Hounds of the Corn are so good. I mean, these guys can hit and move all over the battlefield, and that really is one of Corn's big strengths, is that they're an incredibly mobile faction. Uh, they can just hit and run. They basically will hammer and hammer you. You know you have the hammer and anvil. Well, Corn is like hammer and hammer. So the Flesh Hounds are usually what you'll have on the flanks. And yeah, 65 weapon strength, but 22 of that is still armor piercing. I've done a little bit of testing with them against the uh, Jade Cavalry of Cathay, and they honestly can, with a little bit of support, can tear them to shreds. If the Jade Cavalry don't get the good charge on them and like the Flesh Hounds jump them, despite not saying quote unquote armor piercing, these guys can just go absolutely deep and do a ton of damage. So yeah, Flesh Hounds of Corn, highly recommend, super good unit in multiplayer. Uh, but as far as campaign goes, you know, a fun unit for sure, but I don't know if it's really the way you're going to want to abuse AI. Spawn of Corn are cool, not much to talk about, just massive weapon strength at 190, so they have the highest weapon strength of all of the spawn units, but really nothing terribly exciting here. They do Rampage as well, so a little bit underwhelming. Now we have the Minotaurs of Corn, so much like the Beastmen, you have the melee Minotaurs with the bonus for infantry or the anti-infantry variant and the anti-large. What's cool about the Corn Minotaurs is they do have uh, better armor values, so you absolutely can use them in campaign to relatively good effect. And in multiplayer, I think they could be niche. I do think Corn has better anti-infantry options, especially via their infantry and cavalry. But Minotaurs of Corn, still the fact that they have better armor makes them a little bit more viable than their Beastmen cousins. And you do, of course, have the anti-large variant. Now you have the Soul Grinder of Corn. Soul Grinders are a very interesting unit. I always kind of felt like they didn't really belong in fantasy, but they can shoot while they're moving. So these guys, the problem is you can't target with them. They just kind of randomly shoot and they're more melee focused, but each Soul Grinder for each different god does something different. And the Corn one is obviously very, very good in melee and it does fire damage. So that's going to be mitigating healing. They have physical and spell resist and they yeah, can do their thing. I, I'm not a huge fan. I think in campaign they could be good because they can mindlessly grind through if you have like a stack of them through the enemy army. But in multiplayer, uh, I'm still on the fence about them a little bit as, as it pertains to their viability. Again, we haven't really gotten the chance to go crazy on multiplayer yet, but I think that these guys will be okay. Maybe I'm like trying to think of matchups. I guess if you really need armor piercing and it does give Corn the ability to, you know, shoot at some flying units and things like that. So next we have the Bloodthirster. So you have the Exalted Boys, but you have the basic ones as well. So basic Bloodthirsters, I think will have a really good place. And the basic Bloodthirster up here, is an anti-large monster. That's pretty much it. He's got physical spell resistance. He's highly mobile with 95 speed, hits like a truck and use fire damage to mitigate healing. Where he's really going to shine is digging out durable targets. Because that's something about corn. we'll talk about later in the guide, is that they do kind of have to deal with, you know, blobs with brute force, which can be tough. So if you're facing like Mortis Engines, the Bloodthirster is your scalpel. He gets in there, he has anti-large, he has really good mass, and he can bully down those type of units. But yeah, in general, I think he's pretty good. I think having like the Bloodthirster plus the Exalted Bloodthirster on the same roster is going to give you a freakishly good goon squad. Like cry your, cry your eyes out, Vampire Counts. The new goon squad is in town. We're talking like Exalted Bloodthirster and Bloodthirster just you know, flying in the sky, doing the Top Gun high five and just going in and gooning things because these guys really, really can do it. And again, his weapon strength will be higher because of the uh, frenzy, if I'm not mistaken. Although I'm not seeing frenzy in the tooltip, which is kind of strange. I could have sworn he had it. But 
Moving on to the final aspect of the corn roster, we do have the Blood Shrine of Corn. The Blood Shrine of Corn is an SCM motorcycle. And this is really a campaign unit. If you have a big stack of them, uh, they can be super obnoxious because they can cycle charge. They heal while they're in combat. And again, they're SEMs, which is really good at abusing the AI. In multiplayer, I'm not as big of a fan. I think they're a little bit more meme in multiplayer, but they look super cool. And I think it's more viable as a mount option for the Herald of Corn. Uh, and yeah, as far as his abilities, he just has Gore Feast, which we talked about, um, and also Encourage. So he is going to be encouraging the nearby coordinate units. Next, we have the Skull Cannon. The Skull Cannon is going to be an interesting one because in traditional pitched battle that we had in Total War Warhammer 2, I think he would have been very good, right? He has a high speed at 68. He could be really obnoxious for like kiting and picking things off and sniping back lines. But obviously we've heard about domination mode and in domination mode, there's going to be objectives. And will he be as good in that mode? Of course, time will tell. But in this case, uh, I think it's like the jury is still out on this one. The skull cannon in campaign can be really funny. Like if you have like a bunch of them, you can certainly abuse the fact that they're SEMs. You can use them as chariots and cycle charge. They imbue fire damage. And, uh, you know, pack a punch. But in my testing of them, they weren't super accurate. So time will tell with this one. But again, I would really say a campaign unit. But he does have the uh, Skull Feast here. So if we look at Skull Feast, when he's engaged in melee, he replenishes ammo. So over the course of a really long, grindy multiplayer game, I suppose he could get his ammo back. But really, I think... Uh, I think... I think he could be okay in campaign. In multiplayer, I would give him like a C. In campaign, probably like an A. I think in campaign, he could be really abused and very strong against the AI. So that is the breakdown of the roster. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be jumping in and taking a look at the army abilities of Korn and showing you them in action. Here we are in battle, and all of the armies in Total War Warhammer 3 do have access to army abilities, which build up over time based on different parameters. So for Corn, if we mouse over, Blood for the Blood God, points are generated for each enemy entity killed, so you need to do damage. So obviously a very effective way to fight Corn would be to avoid combat if possible. But nonetheless, you're going to have to fight them eventually. The blood will flow from somewhere and the good times will roll. So the first army ability is the Horn of Corn. This one is an AoE buff. You can basically just give melee attack to units in a relatively small radius, but it's quite nice. If there's a big Alpha Strike fight on an important point of the battlefield, this is going to be able to sauce your guys up. The next one is the Relentless Rage, which is probably one of my favorite ones they have. Entities cannot die while this ability is active and it lasts for 20 seconds. Typically what I like to do for this one is, let's say I have my Blood Crushers of Corn about to go fight some uh, Demogriff Knights or something that's like gonna be a very bloody attrition heavy fight and I have an expensive unit that I don't wanna lose my models. Well, then right as you're about to fight that, you pop the Relentless Rage on your guys and they are going to just be getting super steroided, which is very, very fun. And what's also pretty cool about Relentless Rage, I've used it to pretty good success in a battle. I had Scarbrand and he was in a situation where he was fighting like multiple heavy enemies and just getting absolutely dumb on right but he was still doing a ton of damage back so i used relentless rage on him and he cannot die so he was pretty much zero hp but considering he was doing like 900 weapon strength to hit and just going crazy another 20 seconds of scarbrand beating on you is really really good i say i think relentless rage is probably their best army ability Next up, you have the Blades of Corn. This is a bombardment ability. It does a ton of damage, but it's going to be taking a lot of resources. So uh, the blood for the blood god you need to get goes from bottom to top. It's going to be quite hard there and really will take its time. We now have the Blades of Corn. So let's go ahead and pop that right here on these Jade Warriors so you guys can kind of see what that looks like. So here it comes. One, a two, and a three, and that should do huge damage. Boom! Headshot right on those Jade Warriors. Very, very strong ability indeed. I absolutely love it. All right, my friends, and now we're here with the tactics section of the guide, which is going to be showing you some of the more efficient ways to use the units on the corn roster. So the first showcase here is going to be with the Flesh Hounds of Corn, and it is going to be character sniping. Now, Flesh Hounds of Corn are amazing for chasing down missile units. They're really good for flanking. And honestly, even though it doesn't say armor piercing on their tooltip, they have 65 weapon strength, with 22 of that being armor piercing. So they can honestly do okay against armor. Now, much like other hound units, you don't want to be charging in head on. They only have 30 armor, their melee defense is subpar, and they do have a little bit of physical resist being like a scary demon unit, of course, but uh, you still don't want to be doing that. They're really a flanking unit, really an ambushing unit, and if you're able to catch people off guard, they can do great work. Now, much like in the lore of the Corn of Flesh Hounds here, they're very effective at hunting down squishy casters, and honestly not bad against tanky lords as well. Their price point is, I believe, 700 gold, and against casters that are going to be costing anywhere from 1200 to, uh, you know, 1600 or even a, like a Jade Wizard of the Empire, you're going to be getting your money's worth for sure. So in this case, we're going to get the two Flesh Hounds of Corn, move them up, and I will put one on a heavily armored character, which is going to be the Magistrate for Cathay, and the other one is going to be going after the uh, Squishy Astromancer here, who has 15 armor, which again is like somewhat in the normal purview of these type of characters, right? 
So we'll see if we can split them up a little bit. It's going to be tricky, of course, uh, here in this particular version of the game. I don't have too many people to play with, so I'm having to do this myself. So let's go ahead and charge in with the hounds here and charge in with the hounds here. So what you want to do is you want to get the initial charge. So you charge, and once you get the uh, blunt force impact, you move and get a better surround. So what you do here, I'll just kind of pause it so you can see. So you can see we get the impact damage, but after that, you want to move in and move in on top of them like this to actually get the proper surround and then you attack in. So in this case, we have uh, the Flesh Hounds on the Lord Magistrate, who does have, uh, oh, he doesn't have a lot of armor, actually, that's right, unless he's on his mount. But this is an expensive Lord for Cathay, right? And we have like two cheap Hound units here, right? Normally Hound units would not do this kind of damage, but look how like badly they're massacring this Astromancer. It's only been a couple seconds, he's already at half health, and here you have the Lord Magistrate, who is a relatively tanky combat Lord with uh, good combat sets, low armor, however, but showing you the effectiveness of sniping characters with Bloodhounds. If this was in a multiplayer battle, like you would just straight up like have murked this caster. And that was like, what, like 10, 15 seconds? And the Astromancer and the Lord Magistrate just got absolutely destroyed. So this has been something that I found to be super strong. If you're able to catch a caster, whether it be in campaign, let's say you have like an AI caster there, like it'll be dead in a matter of seconds, especially if you have campaign upgrades for these Flesh Hounds of Corn. But a multiplayer, if you're able to catch their casters like this, or even characters that are, you know, not are fighters, but are lightly armored, the Flesh Hounds of Corn with their high melee attack and their charge bonus of 46 plus like 65 weapon strength are going to absolutely give the dirty. So I highly recommend using this strategy. It is very strong. The next tactic here with Corn is going to be Farm Brand the Exiled. So yes, I do call it that on purpose because he does have a farming ability. If we take a look at his weapons, which are Slaughter and Carnage, he's going to be getting increasing damage as he gets kills. So it's very tempting with a big scary bloodthirster like this to get in and just go right after characters and high value targets. And there will be times where you want to do that. But it's also very important with Scarbrand to farm a little bit. He's he is after all farm brand the exile. He needs to be getting in there with those uh, weapons and farming a bit. And that can be very smart, right? You get kills on because he does not actually get the scaling damage unless models are killed. So if you send him in to fight SEMs or single entity models right away, He's not going to be getting the benefit of his weapons. So you really do want to take advantage of that. Try and get some kills first to make him into a raid boss and then go for it. Now, if you're looking for pre, uh, pure gooning, which I'll be showing you in the next tactic, you want to probably be using the Exalted Bloodthirster instead of Scarbrand if we're talking about multiplayer. And uh, we do take out a couple horsemen. So now you can see we're up to 515. So as we get the kills, our damage is going to be scaling. So what? this is so strange. They usually attack. There you go. All right. So now we're in there and currently he's up to 523. So we are farming a little bit, right? And taking a little bit of damage, of course, but nothing too crazy. And the peasants are, uh, yeah, they're just, they're, they're, they're learning the cycle charge. They've been watching some Total War Warhammer 2 uh, gameplay here and they're learning the way. But regardless, the farming is going well, and currently Scarbrand is up to 537. The damage is scaling, getting higher and higher, and this becomes really strong with Farm Brand because when you do use the Wrathful Reaper, you get a percentage-based increase. So the more you farm over the course of a long battle, the better you're going to be getting from the Wrathful Reaper and some of these other abilities. So in this case, we're going to use Rage and Body. That's actually going to drag all these guys in here, which is pretty hilarious. And Farm Brand is just going to go farming, man. And yeah, unfortunately, some of these guys are getting terror routed and whatnot, but you can see we're almost up to 600 weapon strength. And we really haven't been fighting that long. It's only been a couple minutes. So I would say over the course of like a standard multiplayer battle, Farmbrand is going to be able to get up to like six or 700 if you play him like correctly. In this case, obviously the AI is running, but you can use his other effects like the Bellow of Endless Fury to get some breath attacks. And that will also get you some damage as well. So if we can actually escape this blob, we'll see if I can showcase that. But regardless, we'll do a little bit of fast forwarding here. Farmbrand is farming quite well, beating down all the peasants. His weapon strength is now up to 621. So this is where he starts to get really scary, right? And this can go up to, I think, 100% increase. So you can get up to like 1,000. Now in a long campaign battle, this can be freaky strong too. So peasant horsemen getting karate chopped. Now, once we clear out all the peasant horsemen, we can pop rage and bodied. And this is an ability with farm brand that you want to use when you have an isolated SEM. You don't want to be using it in blobs because what's going to happen here is he's going to uh, just beat on chaff instead of hitting the target that you want. So now we're up to 734 on the weapon strength after getting 133 kills, which you can actually get farm brand up super quickly by using the Bellow of Endless Fury on a blob because he'll get like 50 or 60 kills instantly. It's just based on kills. So it doesn't matter if you're going after elite units or, or cheap units. If you could just like take out some Bretonian peasant mobs, things like that, that's going to be fine. So now you're going to see farm brand moving in. He is going to go after the Lord Magistrate. So we'll let him get in combat here. And uh, yeah, he, he did the hoof chop right there, but we're going to pop Rage and Body. So now he's rampaging, but his strength is going to be 966. So I mean, pretty insane for sure. And obviously on campaign and things like that, you're going to be able to go pretty crazy with that. Unfortunately, sometimes foot characters do have a little bit, little bit of a problem hitting him. There you go. So one shot brings the guy to like half health, basically. And uh, you can even get even crazier by using the uh, the army abilities here, right? So if we want to use like the Horn of Corn, we can do that. And he's going to be able to farm these guys up. So we'll just do some fast forwarding here while he karate chops his lord. And yeah, I mean, pretty brutal. 
And that's not even like, that's yeah, 1600 value mostly on Peasant Horseman, but if you're facing like Skaven, for example, and Farmbrand's able to get a good breath attack on like a blob of Skaven Slaves and get 100 kills instantly, he's going to be in really good shape. So I'm actually going to show you guys that here in just a second. We'll move in there, and I think that's a good enough angle. So instantly, let's see if he gets it off. Come on, Farmbrand, you can do it. And here it comes, one, and two, and a three. So the kills go from zero all the way up to 43, and boom, we get a pretty big spike in our weapons rank, up to 584, right? So that, that literally just gave us an extra 70 weapons rank, one good breath attack. Now imagine had that been one of the ones where you get like, you know, a couple hundred, and yeah, we can show Farmbrand getting in here even more and just getting a ton of weapons rank. I mean, these are Peasant Spearmen, so they will have anti-large against them, but it really doesn't matter too much. So we'll pop this. Yeah, he's up to 800 weapons rank right now. You can already see like having the Peasants nearby is just brutal. You can farm them so much. I'm really excited to use Scarbrand against like Skaven and these other like factions that have a ton of crappy chaff units to see the potential you can get with his uh, Carnage weapon, which goes, it's at 32% right now, and uh, it can go up to 100, it looks like. So I think we have another Breath Attack off cooldown here, but it looks like the Peasants are fleeing the scene. Let's pop a Breath right there, see if we can get them. Farmbrand, get in there. Yep, another uh, Roast going down. He's up to 808 right now on the Weapon Strike Department, 171 on kills. It's so awesome, man. And now we can move in, pop the Wrathful Reaper, and just like literally like just like karate chop this Lord. Although sometimes, you know, foot characters get knocked over. We still do have that problem a little bit in three, but still they die pretty quick. All right, there is Farmbrand the Exiled. That is a t that is a, one of my favorite tactics with Corn. if you're going to be using the Legendary Lord. <laughs> Jeez, it just still going to town there. So as we saw with Farmbrand the Exile, he's a little bit more of a sustained combat character, whereas if you're looking to do the Bloodthirster Goon Squad, which is another tactic I'm going to be showing you right now, you probably want to go with the Exalted Bloodthirster here in Old PvP. So you get him teamed up with another Bloodthirster, and they both have 95 speed, which is insane, right? So like, you know, if you're facing off against like Vargolf, so you have like 80 speed or like Vampiric characters, Mortis Engines, it's one of the only ways Korn has to deal with like big SEMs is using Bloodthirsters. Um, but in this case, you want to be using the Exalted Bloodthirster Goon Squad. So he, of course, has Burning Rage, which is another way to apply fire damage. Fire damage in Total War Warhammer 3 does uh, half the rate at which units heal. So it's really good against healing spamming, which is super obnoxious in multiplayer. He also has a Breath Attack and Bloodthirst, which makes him even quicker, right? So more of a gooning character. Scarbrand can goon very well, especially after he, after he farms. But these guys are a little bit better at doing your good old passion gooning. So in this case, we have Cathay. Cathay is going to be here with the Lord Magistrate as well as the Terracotta Sentinel. And uh, we're going to try and jump on the Sentinel and see what kind of work we can do. So obviously, we have Breath Attacks if we want to. We can jump over here and drop a Breath Attack down the line. So much like Dragons, right? You have the sweet, sweet Breath Attacks on the Bloodthirsters. And they're actually pretty good. You can see here, should do some solid damage. Yep, right down the pipe. And yeah, it's great. Much like a Dragon. And they're very, very quick too. So we get the damage there on the Jade Warriors. That does get us a little bit of Cornate Love. And now we will pile in from both sides. So if we move in here, we can get you charging in the front. That one has anti-large. And the other one here is going to be using the Deathbringer, which is not Rampage him, unlike Scarbrands, making them better gooning characters. And I forgot to use the charge bonus, whatever you see it. So you can get on these SEMs and uh, boom, there he goes. He's landing. And now we can just watch and sit back while they just kind of circle beat down this character. So you can see... Uh, I think only one of them might be attacking right now. Sometimes there's some landing issues. This is very early in the uh, in the beta that I'm recording this, so it's not quite ironed out yet. But yeah, you can see how quickly they drag this down, right? And even if they come for you, you have good mass. You can get really, really good cycle charging. You could charge back in with this guy, start beating him down with the Bloodthirster. The other one can charge in as well. It's a very strong tactic, and in general, uh, gooning with corn is going to be very, very good. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Maybe Slanesh will give them a run for their money, but time will have to tell, my friend. So there's the corn gooding tactic with the Bloodthirsters. We could also move over here and get on the Lord. Like, the Bloodthirsters are such scary combat characters that pretty much any mortal characters won't be able to go fisticuffs with them. Uh, but again, on that same note, they're also very, very expensive. So you have to take that into account. Uh, the Bloodthirster himself costs well over 2,000 gold, and the Exalted Bad Boy is in the same ballpark. You pop this, he gets up to 653. Certainly rookie numbers compared to your boy Scarbrand, but you guys get the picture. All right, so let's talk about the strengths of the Corn faction. So what does Corn bring to the table? Well, firstly, they're extremely hard hitting. But Corn, typically, if you're looking at their uh, examples on tabletop, Corn is very hard hitting. They don't typically hit quite as hard as Slanesh does in like an immediate burst, but Corn is very, very hard hitting over the course of long sustained combat, which is why we see Frenzy. We see Scarbrand, of course, with his uh, his items, the Slaughter and Carnage, which give him more damage over time, the more models he kills. So Corn is really good at those long fights where he could just hit super hard and grind through his opponents with just pure attrition and uh, just brute force, which I really, really like. I think they really captured that quite well here in this game. On top of that, Corn is very mobile. It might not seem like it, but the demon units have speed almost in the 40s, which is very similar to Elvish units. The mortals are much slower with 28 speed, similar to Chaos Warriors, but 
They're very fast with their demonic infantry. Uh, Flesh Hounds of Corn, which I think in PvP are going to be the best unit on the roster, are incredibly quick with 95 speed. And honestly, against things like Empire Knights and Jade Warriors and like Cav that aren't super like elite, the Flesh Hounds of Corn with a little bit of support can really wreck like anything they hit. Yeah, they have 65 weapon strength, which is insane. They hit super hard and do also have 22, per uh, 22 armor piercing damage from that 65, which really isn't terrible. I've done a little bit of testing with Flesh Hounds against various units like these uh, cavalry units, and they are actually able to trade surprisingly well. So don't underestimate the uh, Flesh Hounds here. They can crumble formations and really are going to be super strong. So again, Corn is hard hitting, mobile, and moderately durable too. Like the Corn roster is very armored. Warriors have 100 armor. Uh, the Greater Demons have 90 armor apiece, which is going to make them very strong against small arms fire. The Minotaurs of Corn have 70 armor as opposed to the 35 that the Beastmen variants have. The Cavalry have 130 armor and 100, and their SEMs are all super heavily armored. So the roster is really, really durable. Now, not going to be as durable as someone like Nurgle, most likely, but Corn still really can stay in and fight. And that obviously is going to be super important when we're able to get access to the domination mode and uh, they're fighting for, you know, objectives and things like that, right? Uh, squishier factions are going to turn and run, whereas the uh, champions of the Blood Gods are going to be collecting some skulls and having a good old time. And also the last thing is they're very angry, which is great. Anger is always, always a, you know, a little bit of Sith action. It lends some strength to your cause. And that is the strengths of Korn. And now for the weaknesses. Well, Corn is very one-dimensional. Uh, they have like one range unit, so your opponent is more or less going to know what you're bringing. If you're facing off against Cathay, well, Cathay is going to know that their infantry is armored, and they're going to know that you're bringing Bloodletter. So how do they counter that? Well, they're probably going to bring some crossbows and missile pieces to really focus down the low armored blood letters, right? So the one-dimensional aspect of corn is, you know, a little bit problematic in that your opponents in multiplayer might just know exactly what you're doing. But corn seems to be really, really good at executing their game plan, so it might not matter. They might be so good at that that they can still punch through you. On top of that, corn doesn't have any magic, which you guys have seen. Like magic is probably one of the strongest things in both campaign as well as multiplayer. And corn does not have access to that. They have very good army abilities and some good utility on their characters with activatables, but overall they do not have magic, and that is a substantial weakness. Really, really uh, don't have the ability to punish blobs outside of breath attacks, and you know they're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. And on top of that, the last thing I think is going to be an issue for corn, especially in a multiplayer, is that corn has to remove uh, big SEM threats using brute force so you have to go into melee with scarbrand you have to go into melee with the bloodthirster so you don't have ranged tools and we've seen this in total war warhammer one factions that have weak range typically struggle with things like mortis engines because mortis engines can be protected by vampiric monsters or you know other mortis engine effects depending on the faction have you know various other tools for protecting them but corn is only going to have really one way to get in there and deal with it and that's brute force which can work it's very micro intensive and you have to have very good sem micro but just kind of take that into account in dealing with those type of factions like vampire counts and uh, you know things like that when the time does come. Not going to be a problem for now because they're not going to be in the game at launch, but still something to consider. So that is my overall assessment of their strengths and weaknesses. I think that Corn is going to be a very strong faction in multiplayer. So if we're talking about like S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, I think that Corn, based on my predictions for domination mode and what it brings to the table, uh, with objectives and whatnot, I think that Korn's mobility and their staying power and ability to fight on objectives is going to make them a solid A tier faction. I don't think they're going to be S tier. Nothing here feels like terribly broken. It feels balanced and it feels like it's good at what it does, but it doesn't feel like they can do everything and just absolutely be OP, right? They feel like a fair faction and I think they're going to be a solid A tier. Mobility will give them the option to move around the battlefields and really uh, get on those good points and flank your opponent's positions. And on top of that, I think they're uh, going to be good at grinding on objectives, especially with the mortal characters, right? They have incredibly good leadership with Frenzy. Frenzy will give them, uh, although oh, it looks like they changed it, but nonetheless, they will be immune to psychology with good base leadership value. So. so that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you enjoyed my corn army guide. If you have any suggestions for future army guides, do let me know. The next video is going to be uh, the next video we have on the corn army will be a build guide so i'm essentially going to be giving you builds for every single matchup so if you're looking to play against corn or play as corn in multiplayer and you need something hey your friend is really good at slanesh what are some builds i can bring to the table to fight against them so that'll be coming out as soon as we are allowed to cover multiplayer a little bit more and uh we can go from there so thanks again and once again blood for the blood god skulls for the skull throne we'll see you guys soon thanks for joining and that is it for now